It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Acting Premier. Last week, this Conservative government announced deep cuts to our education system that will leave students in our province worse off. There will be more kids in crowded classrooms, fewer teachers and educators in our schools, and at least a billion dollars cut from education over the term of this government. Why is this government so determined on dragging our kids in this province backwards when it comes to our education system? Questions placed to the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'm pleased to stand up and talk about the announcement that we shared on Friday. First of all, let me share that I want to congratulate the Ontario Science Centre on their 50th anniversary of bringing to science, order. technology, and innovation to our young people. Just uh, the day before, they had entertained 7,000 kids and, and parents, and I just think it was a perfect platform for which uh, we could stand on and introduce our announcement. When it comes to actually what we were talking about, we introduced so many concepts that is going to take our education system Response. well ahead into the future and enabling students to embrace not only the realities of today, but the skills they need for the jobs of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Acting Premier. Uh, I think we all know when class sizes get bigger, student learning can suffer. There will be less opportunities for students to get the one-on-one -on -one attention, which will hurt students with the most complex needs. And teachers will be stretched even thinner to trying to deliver quality education that their students deserve. Speaker, parents know. Teachers know and students know what this government ought to know. Cramming more students into under-supported classrooms is not the way to boost student achievement. Will this government go back to the drawing board and come back with a plan that actually works and will serve the needs of students in our province? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'll tell you what the PC government of Ontario is going to do. We're going to make sure that students in this province from one end of Ontario to the other actually finally have the confidence that they're learning the basic skills and fundamentals that are going to encourage and help them get the jobs of tomorrow. I'm telling you, the last decade and a half, students in Ontario were left scrambling. Parents were having for being forced to seek out tutors to help them with math. Parents were forced to really try and help their students the best they can because, quite frankly, the previous Liberal government failed our students. And there's proof points to that. And, Speaker, I have to tell you that we're not only standing with parents in our announcement and our plan forward, where education is going to work not only for parents but for students and Response. teachers. We are just looking so forward to working with our education partners and our school boards because at the end of the day, the greatest factor in determining a student's success is the effectiveness of the teacher. Thank you. <laughs> Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, through you to the minister, I think that we all know by uh, cramming more students into a classroom, we aren't increasing effectiveness. Firing thousands of teachers and cramming as many as 40 students into high school math classes Side come to order. will not help students achieve more. By taking away one-on-one -on -one attention, by taking away specialized classes, by taking away in-person instruction, this government is making the future a lot less bright for more kids. Will this government reverse their course and scrap the scheme to increase class sizes and firing teachers before it is too late? Members, please take your seats. Minister to respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I need to get it said right now. I fundamentally reject the premise of that particular yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. be perfectly clear, Speaker. There will be no involuntary job losses under our plan. We're standing with our teachers. We actually are absolutely Position positive that parents understand, students understand, that the investment that we're making in Ontario's education system to make sure our students are prepared. Again, the previous government 
but did an absolute dismal job introducing ideologies that failed our students. Speaker, I can tell you once and for all, we're getting back on track in Ontario. We're announcing plans to our, to ab our absolute Response. plan that has been well received, and I look forward to speaking for about the endorsements from our stakeholders and future questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Speaker, we've just received word that Global News has obtained a very troubling letter written by the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston. The member describes being removed from the government's caucus as a political revenge plot because he tried to blow the whistle. Speaker, he alleges that he was kicked out of caucus because he raised, and I quote, concerns of possible illegal and unregistered lobbying by close friends and advisors employed by Premier Ford. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. What possibly illegal and unregistered lobbying has been happening behind closed doors with this government? Response, Deputy Premier. To Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, Speaker, obviously, I, I, I don't know uh, about this letter that uh, the member opposite speaks, but what I, what I can uh, speak to is, uh, is my relationship with uh, the member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston. Uh, obviously, we share a number of uh, organizations. Uh, we, uh, you know, the health units. In our riding, the school board, a number of agencies. Opposition so come I, to order. I appreciate uh, and will continue, no matter uh, in what capacity that member uh, sits in this house, that uh, I'll continue to work with him. And uh, again, if the member has uh, allegations to make, uh, you know that's uh, that's his uh, his choice. Uh, in opposition, uh, we on this side of the house want to continue to talk about government policy. Want to continue to talk about uh, the work that we're doing in our communities. We feel very strongly that uh, members should be uh, allowed to speak, but in terms of, uh, of the contents of whatever allegations the member is talking about, uh, he'll have to uh, disclose them. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, these accusations are serious. The word illegal is not used lightly by members of this House. Now the people of Ontario are left to wonder. Speaker, they're wondering if Chris Froggett and Dean French worked out a deal to let people buy their way into Doug Ford's back rooms. Or, Speaker, is the member from Lanark Frontenac Kingston referring to cash for access fundraisers? Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm very disappointed in, uh, in the member's unfounded uh, allegations. Uh, this government, uh, for the people, uh, respects uh, the rules of this House, respects uh, the rules in terms of the Integrity Commissioner, the lobbyist registry, the rules that uh, we, uh, we have to operate under this House. I, I can tell you that, uh, that uh, whatever the member is trying to get at uh, is not uh, with any basis of truth. I can speak for myself. I can speak to how I here? operate in my office. I, I know my colleagues in Cabinet, and I know, quite frankly, uh, my colleagues on, on, uh, on both this side of the House and the members opposite. Always act with integrity, always act with the people in mind, and any other uh, allegation, any Response. other suggestion is absolutely, completely false speaker. Stop the We start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, if people's pockets are being lined in exchange for favours, the people have a right to know. It seems as if there was a secret emergency cabinet meeting this morning, maybe so that the Aside, members of the cabinet could get their story straight. Speaker, which story have they landed on? Is it a reference to cash for access fundraisers, or is it this separate pay-to-play deal that we're seeing unfold here today? The member is asking, uh, obviously, a very serious question, making ser serious statements. I have to be able to hear the response, um, but I would caution all members of the House in terms of their language and the use of language so that it's parliamentary. The minister can respond.
Speaker, through you to the member. I don't know what uh, meeting this uh, this member was talking about. I don't know what type of access he means. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you something, Speaker. You know, our government has been very clear on on in terms of going through the fundraising rules and ensuring that uh, that if a if a grandmother wants to come to a twenty-five dollar spaghetti dinner for one of their members, yes. They, they can go on our site, they can look at those, uh, those uh, events, and they can attend. But in terms of, of trying to do anything else, in terms of, of lobbyists or anything that the member is trying to insinuate or, or suggest, it's absolutely not true. For Essex, come to order. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Acting Premier. Parents and educators across the province were shocked by Friday's announcement of deep cuts to Ontario's public education system to be achieved through a dramatic reduction in the number of teachers and dramatically larger class sizes. Fewer teachers, less support for students. As boards have been looking over the implications of these cuts, we are learning more about what the impact will be. As a result, elementary school teachers expect to see 4,500 jobs lost. Secondary school teachers expect to see 3,600 jobs lost. And I'm hearing unparliamentary comments from the government side. I, could, I can't see who—I'm not sure who said it. Stop it. I apologize to the member for Davenport for interrupting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I hit a nerve. And the Toronto District School Board expects to see over a thousand jobs lost alone. But the Minister of Education said, and I quote, not one teacher, not one will lose their jobs because of our class size strategy. Acting Premier, what which is it? Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Questions referred to the Deputy Minister of Education. Premier and Speaker, thank you to you as well for giving me an opportunity to set the record straight here. Because the fact of the matter is, I think, I think the member opposite has been using her own discovery math. Because oh. I was very emphatic actually on Friday saying there will be no involuntary job loss. Here, here. Now, how on earth can she be pulling numbers? perhaps out of the cloud. Who knows where she pulled those numbers from? Because quite frankly, the school boards and, and my ministry will be working together in the weeks and months to come because we have to assess the number of retirements, the number of resignations, and the number of redeployments that all factor order. into this. So I would suggest to the member opposite, Opposition stop, members spinning, come to order. stop fear mongering and celebrate the fact that we are finally Spons. going to get Ontario education back on track. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Member for Davenport Supplementary. I'll tell you where I got those numbers. I'll tell you where I got those numbers, Mr. Speaker. I got them from a memo written by Craig Snyder, Acting Associate Director, Business Operations and Service Excellence of the Toronto District School Board. Thank you very much. He says that the reduction in just the Toronto District School Board alone is going to be 216 fewer Herman teachers, side, come to order. four to eight. He says the impact will be a reduction of approximately 800 teachers in secondary schools in that one board alone. Uh, the impact will be a reduction of funding another additional 82 teachers. I could go on. We know, we know what the impact is going to be, and the minister wants to argue, Mr. Speaker, that when somebody retires and you don't fill a position, that that's not a job lost. Tell that to the teachers who won't be getting a job. Tell that to the students who are going to have 40 kids what? in their class. Does the acting premier really believe Ontarians gave her government a mandate to balance the budget on the backs of our kids? Has been referred to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, and again, I absolutely reject the premise of which that member opposite is trying to fearmonger. You know, it's absolutely
absolutely no opposition sense. come to order. The fact of the matter is, she should be celebrating that we're getting back to the basics in math. Right come on, she's got experience in a, in a school board herself, and she knows full well over the last decade and a half, the past Liberal government absolutely failed our students. And because of that, we have a lot of work to do, and we're rolling up our sleeves, and we look forward to here, working here. and making sure that education works for parents, teachers, students, and our school boards. We've introduced a new math curriculum. We've renewed a focus on Mr. STEM. We're looking at a modern, age-appropriate health and physical education, and we have Member a clear, for policy, Davenport, come to order. clear policy with regards to our Response. process at the, where parents can work better with teachers. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The minister recently visited Cappuccino Bakery, a small business in Nobleton. Cappuccino reflects the backbone of Ontario's economy. They make significant investments. They pay their taxes, and they hire people and create jobs in the community they call home. All they expect in return from their government is respect for their tax dollars and to have access to quality health care, education, and other critical services. That's why it was so significant for the Minister of Finance to visit this small business to make his important announcement. Could the Minister inform the House about his announcement and what it will mean for the people of Ontario? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Brantford Brant. It was a pleasure to visit the bakery with the member from King Vaughan uh, to announce that our government's first budget will be coming on April 11th. Yeah. Through our through our province-wide pre-budget consultations, the message we heard came through loud and clear. People are struggling in a province that has been overtaxed, overregulated, and faces threats to the services we rely on because of spiraling government debt. We can all clearly see the results of 15 years of lib liberal neglect and reckless spending, and it's time to take action. Our first budget will continue our work to restore confidence by laying out responsible path to balance. We will continue to provide much-needed relief to families and small businesses while protecting what matters most, health care and education. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. I think we can all agree that for far too long the people of Ontario have been forced to feel like they are working for their government. And you know what? It's about time that their government started working harder for them. I have full confidence that our first budget will truly put the people at the heart of government. To do otherwise would be foolish. Unless we take urgent action, it will be our children and grandchildren who will inherit the Liberals' mountain of debt and continue to pay more for fewer services. That's wrong, Mr. Speaker, and it's unfair to leave that burden for future generations to shoulder. Could the minister please remind the House what is at stake for our province today and our children's province of tomorrow? Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker. To put it bluntly, the previous Liberal government left behind a fiscal mess. We inherited a $15 billion deficit and a $346 billion debt. That's three, four, six with nine zeros behind it. The Liberals were spending $40 million a day more than they brought in, Speaker. As a result, the interest we pay on that debt is now the fourth largest item in the budget. This has to end. We must put Ontario back on a path that is Order. fiscally responsible. We must bring relief to families and businesses that have been overtaxed and overburdened for 15 years and received nothing Member in return. Ottawa, so we must to work order. together to protect the services that matter most. And Speaker, on April 11th, we will Spons. lay out our plan to do exactly that. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Acting Premier. Uh, the Brant Children's Aid Society, which is located in the riding of Brantford Brant, has been forced to lay off 26 child protection workers as a direct result of this government's actions. Okay. The executive director of the Brant uh, Family and Children's Service said, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, when governments cut child welfare services, children ultimately die. 
or are allowed by society to live in unbearable, violent and neglectful conditions. Mr. Speaker, why is this government putting children at risk with these reckless cuts? Precious, the Deputy Premier. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My pleasure to, uh, to rise to respond to uh, what I don't think are necessarily accurate portrayals of what's happening on the ground. Uh, since 2015, the former Ministry of Children and Youth Services, uh, under the previous administration, was working with the Brant Children's Aid Society to identify cost reduction strategies. These efforts have been unsuccessful, and the Brant Children's Aid Society continues to struggle to deliver services. In addition to that, and I think this is something the government should be very proud of and every Ontarian should be very proud of, we are moving to, in many cases, an Indigenous-led child welfare system, as we have in the Six Nations or Ogwen and E. Duya uh, First Nations, and we are transferring about 18 per cent of the children and the caseload uh, into that First Nations and Indigenous-led uh, child welfare system. This is something we're proud of in terms of customary care. We know Indigenous children are overrepresented in the children's Fine. society system, and that's why we're moving toward that model to bring customary care into the community for those children to better serve them. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I have to say, when it comes to vulnerable children, this government's record is nothing to be proud of. Brands Children Aid Society looks after 300 children in foster care in the Brantford Brant riding. They will run out of money on Friday. But when the society came to this government asking when funding for the new fiscal year would be provided, this government decided to play hardball. As a result, they have had to lay off 26 staff members. Wow. The Premier committed to the people of Ontario that no jobs would be lost in their quest to balance the budget. Yep. But we've seen job loss after job loss. I ask, how can this government justify this betrayal of the most vulnerable children in Brantford, Brant, and in the rest of Ontario? Sure. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, what that member opposite is suggesting that the 18 per cent of Indigenous youth who are going to a customary care model uh, as, as an Indigenous-led children's aid society don't deserve the funding that is required for them to get the services that they need. I will say that we are proud as a government to continue on the legacy of previous administrations as we move to a more Indigenous-led focused uh, approach. Opposition but if the member order. opposite is suggesting that this is an overnight problem, it dates back to 2015. That's four years ago where this Children's Aid Society has refused to look after its uh, fiscal uh, house and get its services in order as we transition. This is not new. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was able to sign off on the 12th uh, Indigenous-led Children's Aid Society. I was at the UN last week speaking with Indigenous leaders from Canada about uh, our work with the federal government as we move to a more appropriate model Response. for Indigenous youth in the province of Ontario and hopefully throughout the rest of Canada. Order. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Attorney General. Speaker, we on this side of the House have great respect for Ontario's construction sector. It's an industry that is one of our economy's key drivers. My riding of Carleton alone is home to some of Eastern Ontario's biggest construction companies and job creators, including Tomlinson Group of Companies, Marathon Drilling, Gary Crepp and Cartage, Osgood Sand and Gravel, and Thomas Cavanaugh Construction Limited. The new Construction Act will soon bring in, uh, into force a new regime that will ensure Ontario construction workers get paid on time for the work they do and make the dispute resolution process faster and simpler. And through you, Mr. Speaker, would the Attorney General please tell us how our government is bringing into effect this new era of transparency, stability, and certainty for our construction sector? Order. The Attorney General to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member of Car from Carleton for the question. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand up for those working in the construction industry, and we are working very hard to bring into effect the new prompt payment and adjudication framework that will strengthen this sector and lead the country in how we support the construction industry. Prompt payment will provide contractors and subcontractors clarity and certainty around when to expect payment, something fundamental that many in other sectors may take for granted. Our new adjudication process will speed up dispute resolution and save workers time and money, while also prevent unnecessary delays on construction projects. 
Our government is working hard to bring these new tools into force on October 1st. We look forward to delivering this important new framework to, the, to this essential part of this province's Response. economy. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for standing up for this important part of our economy and making sure that the construction industry in Carleton and across Ontario can have the certainty and stability found in other industries. Mr. Speaker, my constituents in Carleton know that this government was elected with a promise to get things done and to make it easier and cheaper for businesses to thrive in today's marketplace. And they expect this government to deliver on its commitments. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the Attorney General please tell us more about how Ontario is implementing this new regulatory framework to ensure that Ontario's construction industry can benefit from the opportunities and protections it brings? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The women and men working in Ontario's construction sector have made it clear that they want this new regime in place on time, and that means October 1st of this year. A key part of this promise is the designation of the Authorized Nominating Authority, the ANA, the arm's length entity that will oversee the new adjudication framework. Last week, our, our government issued the call for applications for the nominating authority, and we look forward to seeing a wide range of applications for this key component of the new Construction Act regime. Our government has developed a fair and transparent selection process that will evaluate the quality, experience and knowledge of entities that apply for the nominating authority designation and will ensure that we designate only the most qualified for this critical job. Construction workers and the construction industry are counting on us, Response. and we take that responsibility seriously. We look forward to continuing to work and communicate with our partners in the construction industry on this important project. Thank you. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. In Ontario, it has taken decades to build up the capacity to support children with autism spectrum disorder, and still we have a shortage of therapists trained to provide evidence-based therapy. Yet, because of this government's disastrous autism program, therapists are being laid off. Yep. Kids Ability in Kitchener laid off nine staff. And that is just the start. Why does the acting premier insist on a plan that causes layoffs when what we actually need is more therapists and more support? Good question. Good question. The deputy premier. Of Children, Community and Social Services. Questions referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, th thanks very much, Speaker. Um, thanks for the opportunity to rise today. I think that uh, one of the things that we're moving to in, in transitioning is a direct funding model to parents to give them an opportunity to, uh, to get the services that they want. I think that these layoffs are pr premature, and I encourage the agencies to understand our plan better. Our plan will mean that there will be four times more children who will be uh, able to access services and Therefore, I think that every child should receive support, and we expect that agencies that are delivering support should continue to deliver quality support to those children. Uh, but let me be clear, my uh, parliamentary assistant, Amy Fee, and I continue to listen to parents, and we continue order. to uh, look Opposition forward to the implementation to of April 1st so we can empower parents directly, and we're looking forward to making sure that the 23,000 children who are presently on a wait list Response. are cleared off that wait list for the first time in Ontario history. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this government claims to provide parents' choice, but what choice will they actually have? First, the government won't provide funding based on need or evidence. Now the ABA therapist shortage will, will get worse as layoffs began. This is going to leave those who can actually afford ABA stuck on wait lists. I wonder if the acting premier knows that it will take decades to rebuild this industry after her government destroys it. Did the acting premier anticipate layoffs of therapy? Workers, or did they? Their unintended consequences uh, is based on their half-baked plan. Collateral damage. <laughs> Minister to respond. I guess the difference between this government and that party is we're fighting for children, she's fighting for an industry. Speaker, we have Carter. consulted 
uh, with hundreds of families. We have done a dozen Order. roundtables. We continue to speak to families to see how we can best enhance their experience as, uh, as parents who are dealing with, with a di autism diagnosis. We have made an historic investment of $321 million. We are doubling our investment into diagnostic hubs. We are going to clear the wait list in the next 18 months. Our priority is for children to get direct funding for Hamilton in order Mountain for them to, to receive the service that they need. But if what the member opposite is suggesting, that I take for the focus West, off of children to and instead and go toward a, an association or an industry, that's not my job. My job is to make sure that those children that are on the wait list get off the wait list, get the service that they need, and their parents get the funding that's required. That's what this government's going to do. That's what this government's going to continue to fight for. Thank you very much. Order. Order. The opposition will come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. On July 13, the government announced the cancellation of the Eastern Fields Wind Power Project in the Nation Township, a decision received with cheers and applause by the people of Glengarry Prescott Russell. Yet we just learned that the Ontario Energy Board issued a license to the proponents for the project. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us if the Eastern Fields Wind Power Project is on or off? Minister of Energy, Natural Resources and Mines. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this has been a difficult uh, file, obviously. The energy uh, portfolio was an absolute, order. absolute mess. Opposition come to order. Important steps, Mr. Speaker, which include a commitment to renewing the hydro leadership, Mr. Speaker, cancelling more than $790 million worth of projects, which would have uh, Mr. Speaker, had the uh, effect of increasing the monthly uh, bills for ratepayers, the people of Ontario who pay their hydro bills, Mr. Speaker. We won't stand for that. We also ended the culture of waste at Queen's Park by cancelling projects, Mr. Speaker, that clearly municipalities didn't uh, want and the grid didn't need. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. The question is simple. Did the government cancel the project like it said it did, yes or no? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A simple answer. We remain committed, Mr. Speaker, to uh, our plan to restore Ontario's confidence in its, our electricity system, to reduce rates for hydro uh, bills for the hardworking people of Ontario, to make it for, more affordable for small businesses, Mr. Speaker, to operate their businesses, large-scale mining companies, Mr. Speaker, and automotive plants who aren't just complaining about high electricity rates, they're complaining about high, unpredictable electricity rates. Mr. Speaker, we're working, we're working to address that. We have now Member for Orleans, come to order. at the Prospector Developers Association conference last week. There's renewed confidence in our Essex, direction come to order. we're taking, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to stay the course. Next question, the member for Halton. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility to watch every penny of taxpayers' dollar, and we don't take this responsibility lightly. We know that a centralized procurement system will create a more effective process, delivering greater value for the people of Ontario. Recent estimates indicate that ministries spend approximately $6 billion annually on procurement. This doesn't include procurement spending in the broader public sector, including our hospital and school boards. Mr. Speaker, every dollar spent inefficiently is a productive dollar lost. We are putting this to an end, Mr. Speaker. Can the President of Treasury Board please inform this House why the government is modernizing our government procurement? Apologize to the member from Milton. <laughs> Response, President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Milton. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, modernizing procurement and realizing its full savings potential was recommended in the Ernst & Young line-by-line -line review. Now, while the former Liberal government liked to pay more for less, 
We promised Ontarians that we would govern differently. I like that. That's why our government is implementing an awful concept, paying Order. less for more. Here, here. In fact, previous estimates show that the Ontario public service and broader public sector combined procurement spend is approximately $29 billion a year. Mr. Speaker, this isn't just about finding almost a billion dollars in savings. It's about making it easier for businesses to do business with government. It's about reducing red tape and making Ontario open Response. for business and open for jobs. Mr. Speaker, it's been a new millennium for almost 20 years, and our procurement system needs to get on with the times. Here, here. Yeah. Member for Milton, supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government for the people was elected on a platform of rebuilding trust and accountability in government. Here, here. In everything we do, we must remember that the money we spend is not ours. It is from the pockets of the people of Ontario and should be used responsibly to better this province, not wasted on pet project or unnecessary expenses, Mr. Speaker. This is the situation we find ourselves in. The people of Ontario weighed down with a $15 billion deficit inherited from the previous Liberal government. A major cost for government is procurement. Government services need to purchase goods and services in order to operate. Are we ensuring this is done in the most efficient and cost-effective way possible? I ask the Minister of Government and Consumer Services, Mr. Speaker, could he outline our government's plan to identify back Question. office efficiencies across government departments and modernize our procurement practices? Questions to the Minister. Questions referred to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Milton for his excellent question. Our government is dedicated to keeping our promises to the people of Ontario and putting Ontario back on a path to balance while protecting our vital public services. Here, here. Today, the pres President of the Treasury Board, MPP Bailey and MPP Cho and I announced three initiatives that will help us achieve this goal. As the minister has said, by centralizing procurement, we'll drive $1 billion in annual savings across government and the broader public sector. We'll leverage our buying power consolidate contracts, transform how we deliver services, and add value by adopting innovative products and services. Mr. Speaker, our Lean and Continuous Improvement Office will streamline how we deliver services and build a culture of continuous improvement across government. We will use the resources and uh, sorry, and we will also modernize voice services across government, saving approximately eight million dollars a year. Bonds. Mr. Speaker, it took 15 years for the Liberals to create their 15 billion dollar deficit, and solving this fiscal crisis will not place overnight. We will, however, start by restoring accountability, sustainability, and trust. Centralized Thank you. Is a practical step. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. My question is for the Premier, the Vice Premier. Health Sciences North in Sudbury has had to let go of 60 frontline healthcare workers, nurses, technicians, hands-on care professionals. Last week, Ontarians learned that jobs would also be lost at the 14 lens, as their services will be amalgamated into the super bureaucracy. Can the acting Premier tell this House? the total number of frontline workers that will lose their job with the creation of the government super bureaucracy for health care. Thank you very much for the question. As the member knows, the issue with Health Sciences North are not new issues. They have been ongoing for some time, and the ministry is working with them to deal with some of the losses they've had and their financial difficulties that they have uh, been dealing with for some time. As for the health plan that we announced several weeks ago, it is to modernize health care in the province of Ontario, and it is meant to connect care for people, to make sure that people receive the best quality care, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's in a long-term care home, or whether it's in their own home. That is the point of this modernization exercise. Supplementary question. The cuts in Sudbury have affected frontline services. We have less access to the breast screening clinic. We have reduction in our seating program that help people that need specialized wheelchairs. Those services existed long before this government came to power, but now they offer less hours, they offer less access. What will happen with the crown jewel of our healthcare system once it falls under the mega bureaucracy? 
Will the world-class institution like Cancer Care Ontario, like Trillium Gifts of Life, will they also have to reduce their hours and decrease access to their services? What commitment can the minister give today, the acting premier give today to those health care workers? What commitment can she give regarding staffing? Deputy Premier. Well, dealing first with the issues at Health Sciences North, the uh, breast screening assessment service is not closing. There have been some uh, rumours that have been spread out there by I'm not sure who, but it is not closing. Since, 2000, uh, since the year 2000, patients have come to the clinic for breast screening, mammograms, diagnostic imaging services, biopsies and navigation, and those services are certainly going to continue. But with respect to the bigger picture and the plan that we have developed for the entire province of Ontario, the goal of this, as I've always said, is to strengthen our public health care system to make sure that patients receive connected services. They're not receiving that right now. As soon as people are discharged from hospital, often they're not connected with home care services and they end up back in the emergency departments. The goal of this exercise and the goal Spons. of this plan is to make sure that people feel connected with and receive services from their health care system wherever they are in their health care journey. That is the goal. That is what we're going to continue to work on. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services and the Minister responsible for women's issues. Last week, the Minister joined the Canadian delegation at the 63rd session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. The Commission is held annually and provides an opportunity for UN member states to discuss progress, gaps, and next steps in the fight for gender equity. This year's session included discussions on preventing sexual and gender-based violence and empowering girls through social protection. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister outline the work our government for the people is taking to empower women and girls in combat violence against women in Ontario? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. As Speaker, as the Minister responsible for women's issues, I would like to commend the member for Burlington for being a strong female voice in this legislature and doing the great work she does in her community of Burlington. Uh, she is right. Uh, last week, I had the opportunity to uh, travel with the Canadian delegation to the United Nations to speak about sex trafficking, violence against women, as well as women's economic empowerment. I was able to take part uh, and, uh, and intervene at a session uh, on sex trafficking uh, that was organized by the Vatican. I spoke at the General Assembly about some of the strategic partnerships this government is engaging in in order to support those women who are fleeing domestic abuse, as well as uh, violence against women. And I spent some time with uh, the Federal Minister Mariam Monsef in an Indigenous-led uh, consultation about violence against women, but also the child welfare and protection system. I'll have more to say on the supplementary speaker, but I am proud as an Ontarian that we are leading Response. not only in this country but throughout the rest of the world on our commitment to combat sex trafficking in the province of Ontario and the world. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. You're a constant inspiration to myself and others. And thank you, for, thank you for, um, for empowering women and combat gender-based violence across the province. Mr. Speaker, I know that while attending the commission, the minister had the opportunity to address Opposition the very to important order. topic of sex trafficking. We know that Ontario counts for roughly two-thirds of police-reported human trafficking cases each year. Yep. This is a shocking statistic. But I am proud to know that our minister is taking a leadership role nationally to address this serious issue by co-chairing a human trafficking roundtable with her federal counterpart. Can the minister please explain how our government is working to protect women and girls in Ontario from sex trafficking? Minister. Thank you very much uh, to the member again. Obviously, we want to continue to work uh, to build on the great work that was done by our colleague, uh, Laurie Scott, the Minister of Labour from the Saving the Girl Next Door Act. That's why I've appointed the member from Cambridge and the member from Mississauga Centre to lead consultations on my behalf, and that's why we're working interministerial with the Attorney General, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Labour, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Transportation, and others within our government to make sure that we are looking at an interministerial approach. Uh, that's also why I'm, I'm uh, co-chairing a consultation a process, ta 
task table with the federal minister of health. This is Ontario's dirty little secret. It's also Canada's dirty little secret. When I was at the United Nations, I made it very clear. These women are dehumanized. They are devalued. And if they are not equal, are any of us equal? That is why I will continue to stand in this House with this government for the people to Order. stand and defend Opposition these young women, to bring awareness to these challenges, and make sure that it is not just strong women Fox. who are supporting vulnerable women, but strong men in this assembly and elsewhere across this province who are also defending vulnerable women. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, during the campaign, the Premier stated that not one job would be lost, but in recent weeks, he's changed the message saying that no frontline jobs will be lost. But in Kitchener Waterloo, we saw Grand River Hospital cut 25 full time and 15 part time registered nurses uh, three weeks ago. Speaker, these are 40 jobs lost, and good jobs too. One fired full time nursing equals two thousand hours of lost patient care to people in my community. People deserve better. You cannot rebuild a health care system without frontline nurses in the province of Ontario. So my question is to the Acting Premier. Why did the government not take action to ensure that patients get the frontline care that they need in Kitchener-Waterloo and, indeed, across the province? The Deputy Premier. Well, I can certainly agree with the member that more frontline care is needed. Nurses are the backbone of our health care system, and we, that is the reason why we brought our plan forward. That is the idea, is to put more people into frontline care, because that's what we hear from patients each and every day in the Ministry of Health. That is what we're working towards with the local Ontario health teams that are going to be built, that will gradually be taking over the responsibilities from the lens. That is what is meant to happen, so that there's a lot of people that want to be able to be delivering that kind of care. I travelled broadly last week, as a matter of fact, with groups that are ready to apply to be local Ontario health teams. Can't wait for the application process to start because they're already doing that level of care. That's what we need to see happening across the problem. Thank you. Supplementary. Member for Waterloo again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the health minister used to fight for frontline nurses, and she knows that these cuts right now have consequences. For instance, Becky lives with type 1 diabetes and other chronic illnesses. For years, she was too sick to work. She was in and out of the ER due to diabetic crises, regularly spending one month a year in hospital. But everything changed when Becky became a patient at the Diabetes Centre at Grand River Hospital. The monthly visits were invaluable to her chronic illness management, and her long hospital visits all but disappeared. This was a smart strategic investment in health care, but now the diabetes center services have been cut in half. Wow. Becky will only be able to access care twice a year. How can the government justify cutting frontline jobs that keep people out of the hospitals and healthy in the province? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. There's really two points to be made here. One is that the reason of creating Ontario Health and putting organizations like Cancer Care Ontario, their board, under the uh, Ontario Health is to help promote a better chronic disease management strategy. Yeah. Cancer Care Ontario is an excellent example for providing cancer care and for dealing with renal indications. There's no reason why we can't continue to use that model, which will continue in its present form. They will still be doing the work that they have always done. But that model can be used for diabetes management, for mental health and addictions management. Secondly, with respect to the important role that nurses play in the system, Registered Nurses Association oh, of yeah, Ontario listen up, listen up. has endorsed the plan, which we announced several years ago. List, I would like to call from come Dr. Minister of Transportation, come to order. Of RNAO. Today's I announcement am. marks the beginning of much needed change in the health system and the continued role registered nurses must play in both coordinating Response. with patients in their communities and in helping Ontarians navigate its complexities. We agree. That is the goal, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Stop the clock. <laughs> Order. Order. 
start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Over the past week, we have heard about our government's call on the federal government to legalize single-game sports betting. Given the response to our government's leadership on this file, it is clear that people across Ontario would like to be able to bet on the outcomes of single sports games. People in Ontario and across Canada should be given the option of betting on the Super Bowl or the Grey Cup, for example. Given the increasing popularity of single-game betting, it is important for our government to be able to meet consumer demand and ensure Ontario's high standards for responsible gaming can be met, Mr. Speaker. Could the minister please explain why this change is necessary and how it stands to benefit Ontario? Order. Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Speaker, legalizing single-game sports betting is important to keep Ontario's gaming industry competitive. Eight U.S. states now offer legalized sports betting, and 20 more states are expected to adopt the practice within the next two years, including Michigan and New York. Without legal alternatives in Ontario, consumers are increasingly turning to U.S.-based casinos, which offer single-game sports betting. If Canada were to legalize the practice, our casinos would start to benefit. Workers at Casino Windsor, for example, would benefit from a more competitive position in the industry. That's why we're calling on the federal government to amend the criminal code. Allowing single game Opposition betting will give sports fans more choice and enhance the contributions gaming makes in Response. Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is exciting to hear about how our government is taking action to bring about change that would increase consumer choice and benefit workers in Ontario's gaming industry. It is also exciting to see the support of our government's initiative has been getting. Hopefully, the federal government is listening and will amend the criminal code to allow single-game sports betting in Canada. It is clear that this decision makes sense, Mr. Speaker. Legalization of single-game sports betting has the support of the public, the support of the gaming industry, and the support of many of the sports industries themselves. Member for the Windsor Minister, West, please come to elaborate order. on some of the uh, support behind our government on this file. Minister response. Mr. Speaker, North American Windsor sports leagues are in favour of single-game sports betting, particularly in light of the recent uh, legalization in the U.S. The CFL commissioner says we support the province's initiative to ensure our markets remain competitive and strong. The NBA commissioner says should the federal government permit betting on single sporting events, the NBA would support the province of Ontario offering this form of betting. The NHL commissioner says the NHL believes that a level playing surface for sports betting is in the best interest of the interest of the NHL's sports betting landscape. Speaker, the industry supports this change, Order. the people support this change, and our government King supports Vaughan, this change. It's time for the federal government for to Mountain, amend the order. criminal code and legalize single-game sports betting. Thank you, Speaker. The member for King Vaughan, come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Next question, the member for Kiwetnon. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. As of May 1, uh, the government is shutting down the Ontario Ch Child Advocates Office, uh, resulting in the loss of 20 uh, child and youth advocate jobs. These frontline workers called, uh, answer the calls of uh, young people and kids in crisis. They listen first. They take direction from the child or the youth as to how uh, they can support them to be heard. Mr. Speaker, this office has been in place for 40 years. Why is the government closing the Ontario Child Advocates Office, which employs 20 frontline workers for uh, our most uh, vulnerable children and youth? The Deputy Premier. Of children and community. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the question. I, I really appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, him bringing these uh, concerns to the floor of the House. Uh, look, the government made a decision in the fall economic statement that they would be moving the oversight capabilities over to the Ombudsman's office. Um, that said, 
Uh, my ministry has taken steps so that we can have three tables established for children in care and children in custody. The children in care, uh, there will be an Indigenous-led table as well as a, as a table to, uh, for children of, um, that, are, that, are, uh, that are of colour. And we have also made arrangements to ensure that we embed a child advocate within my ministry so that uh, we ensure that children in custody and care have the access that they need for the advocacy role. But let me be perfectly clear. We believe Order. the oversight capabilities of the Ombudsman are far superior than what we've got now, and we believe that the Ombudsman will, will continue Response. to work uh, forward uh, in a very constructive way, and that's why we're working with Paul Duvet and my ministry, and we're going to continue to work with Paul Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Miigwech again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the youth involved with the Child Advocates Office say their work has saved lives. This government is ending uh, youth partnerships like Feathers of Hope, which helped Indigenous youth all over Northern Ontario and throughout the Ontario. And to 2017, there were 38 suicides in the North. This is 50 times higher than the Canadian average. Shameful. Mr. Speaker, 50 times higher. Young people are losing their dedicated advocate in a team of professional professionals uh, which support the, the important work. This is uh, disproportionately uh, going to hurt, will hurt uh, Indigenous youth. Why is the acting premier isolating Indigenous youth and leaving them without support? Thank you. Members, please take your seats. Minister, response. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, uh, thank you very much to the, the member opposite for his uh, question. I, uh, I've always admired uh, him bringing his concerns to the floor of the Assembly, and I'm looking forward to working with him further. I just want to point out that in 2017-2018, uh, in, uh, the Ontario Ombudsman's Office received 367 complaints. That's more than one a day that had to be referred to the Child Advocates Office. By repatriating the investigative uh, uh, the uh, powers into the Ombudsman's office, working with Paul Dubay, uh, we're convinced that we're going to get better, better uh, reports and more uh, that, that uh, are more effective for this assembly. And so, if anyone is challenging the Ombudsman, I guess this is now the place to do it. But let me be order. perfectly clear: Opposition come uh, we order. take our uh, work with Indigenous youth very seriously, particularly because they are overrepresented in custody and in care. And that is why we are going to set up an Indigenous-led table uh, with children of lived experience, so that we can best support them, and that is why we are also embedding within my ministry uh, a, a child advocate. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. For too long, the hardworking people of this province were faced with inflated costs that they simply could not afford. And to make matters worse, in a couple of short weeks, Ontarians will once again have to pay a new tax. We know that the Trudeau Liberal Carbon Tax is coming into effect on April 1st. It will increase the cost for the people of my riding and across Ontario to heat their homes, fuel their cars, and feed their families. Shame. We're now learning the full impact of just how much this tax will cost our transport businesses, our colleges, and universities. Can the minister inform the House what our government, with the leadership of the Premier, intends to do to stop this regressive, job-killing tax from being imposed on Ontarians? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from uh, Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill, and thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, our, our government made a promise to Ontarians that we would, we would make life more affordable and that we would make it easier for job creators to create jobs and a competitive economy. We promised as well that we could balance a healthy environment and a healthy economy, and that's what we're doing. That's, Mr. Speaker, why our Made in Ontario Environment Man commits us to the 30 per cent reduction by 2005 that the federal government committed to in greenhouse gases, but it does it without a job-killing carbon tax. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
We are also, through our emissions performance standards, which are now out for consultation, making it clear that institutions like colleges and universities will have the opportunity to opt in. Mr. Speaker, that means that those universities, Response. those colleges, will not have to be spending valuable taxpayer dollars, valuable tuition dollars, on paying Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Um, Speaker, I know the uh, Trudeau government's carbon tax will have a direct impact on finances of Ontario's essential services on public institutions. Our carbon tax makes everything more expensive. The resources of Ontario's publicly assisted colleges and universities should be focused on equipping our students with the skills needed to get the high quality of jobs tomorrow, not filling the federal government's coffers. Here, here. Can the minister tell us how the Liberals' failed plan will impact institutions like our colleges and universities? Minister. The, uh, minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Bridges and Richmond Hill for that very important question. Speaker, last Thursday I was pleased to be at Algonquin College with the Minister uh, for Environment, Conservation and Parks, as well as members from Carleton and Ottawa West Nepean, uh, to share the details of the impact of the carbon tax on our universities and colleges. Speaker, we know that the federal carbon tax will cost Algonquin College over $276,000 in 2022 alone and across the entire sector. We know this tax will cost Ontario's universities and colleges approximately $24.7 million by 2023. Speaker, the people of Ontario have paid for a 22 per cent reduction in our emissions, and Spons. we have a plan to get to 30 per cent without a carbon tax. Yeah. Our message is clear. Our publicly funded institutions cannot afford to pay millions of dollars in new taxes to fill the federal government's coffers. Thank you. <laughs> Next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, my question is for the acting premier. Uh, during the campaign, the premier repeatedly told the people of Ontario that not one job would be lost under his government. And in December, when this government decided to eliminate the Office of the Environmental Commissioner, they made no mention of the, any jobs being lost. But we have now learned that at least five people will lose their jobs as a result of this government gutting the Office of the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. Does the acting premier not think these jobs count? The Deputy Premier. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Questions been referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, as is happening so often today, I have to reject the premise of, of the member's question. Mr. 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 Speaker, Ontario will continue to be the only provincial government with an independent environment commissioner, and that commissioner will report through the Auditor General. Why is that, Mr. Speaker? Because the, and this will be the exact same system as the federal government. The federal government, Mr. Speaker, has the same system. Why is that? Because we want to make sure that the environment commissioner has the appropriate focus, has the focus in terms of how the environment is considered, and it is done through an independent sure. office. But it will also be done more effectively, and we will not apologize for being efficient and effective while protecting the environment of Ontario. That concludes the time we have for question period. The member for Willowdale has informed me as a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just uh, wanted to take a moment to announce to the House that my EA last week surprised his long-time long girlfriend uh, with a trip to Barbados, and he asked a very important question. And much to my surprise, Dina Gaulu said yes. So to Ryan Cole and Dina Gaulu, congratulations on your recent engagement. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Scarborough Gildwood on a point of order. Point of order. A speaker, on behalf of the Liberal Caucus, I'd like to welcome to the Legislature the Council of Ontario Construction Association, who are holding their lobby day today, including the delegation. Uh, in the delegation are members of the Toronto Construction Association, including Romeo Milano, their president, John Molenher, and Senior Director of Corporate Development, Susanna Fernandez. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Energy concerning the Eastern Fields and Wind Power Project in the 
Nation Township. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.